In this video, we're going to look at a free and open source tool called Sleuth Kit. And it runs under Linux. It's very easy to download and install, as I'll show you. It, uh, it doesn't have a really nice graphical user interface, although a user interface is available. But what I want you to do first is actually run this from the command line. It's very simple to do. I've got a 30-minute video that shows you how to use it. And we'll start with uh, how to install that under Mint, which of course is going to work just exactly like it does under Ubuntu. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to make sure that we have a terminal open in either Mint or Ubuntu, and we need to make sure that we have our network connection. If we go up to VM and go to Settings, we can see that we're natting here, so we make sure that we've got the uh, internet connection. Let's click cancel. Now this is very difficult, so follow along with me. sudo aptitude install sleuth kit. As it turns out, sleuth kit is in the Ubuntu repository, so it makes it very easy to download and install. Essentially what sleuth kit is, is that it's a bunch of command line utilities that has the ability to forensically analyze an image of a file system and we already know how to create one of those using DD and it has to be a DD image it can't be any of the other images we discussed for example ProDiscover or an in case image which is proprietary but it works with a raw image we hit enter we type our password and we see that uh, there's one, two, three, four, five files that it wants to install. The main file and then some supporting files right here. And we can hit enter. It also installs the man pages for all the files, for all the utilities. And in a second, I will just very quickly show you how to use a couple of the commands and then after this we'll go into more detail with a uh, more comprehensive explanation of how to use all the different commands and then at some point in the future uh, I might install the uh, graphical front end to it which is essentially uh, it uses a browser to uh, to act as a front end to the sleuth kit utilities so the great thing about this is that it's a, a f it's a full-fledged forensics toolkit and it doesn't cost anything so this is something you can install at home for example if one of your uh, if you accidentally delete a file and you need to, to recover it you can always use uh, the sleuth kit to uh, to recover that file now it's it's uh, it's it's not as fancy as the uh, commercial versions that uh, cost two three thousand dollars but you know what it's free so you're kind of getting what you pay for and technically you're actually getting more than you pay for it's a really sweet toolkit okay so it's uh, processing triggers for the, the manual database and we're done and so uh, this is kind of getting a little ahead here um, let's see I think I've got a DD file in here and so we can run the command F stat and it gives us file status information on ntfs.dd and you can see that it reads the file and tells us a lot of information about the file system what it was created on the master file table, the mirror of the master file table, the size of the master file table entries and so on If we'd like to know some information about the files located on this file, we can type FLS for file list files. Doesn't that look familiar? If we take off the F, it's just the LS in Linux. And it tells you all the files are in here as well as their master file table entry and so on. Notice uh, that a lot of these, these in here are reserved or system files. Notice the R over here and then we have our actual data here homework more stuff stuff and so on so that's a, a quick introduction to uh, the sleuth kit and now in the remaining portions of this uh, video we'll go in depth in how to use this to uh, perform a forensics analysis and to recover data
Okay, what is SleuthKit? SleuthKit is a free open source forensics tool that can be used in lieu of other forensic suites, suites such as Encase and Forensics Toolkit. Um, it's great because it fits on a bootable Linux CD, and I believe the most recent copies of Nopix uh, have it uh, pre installed so you can uh, boot into um, Nopix and then uh, uh, pull up these tools from that. Uh, it's an updated version of the Coroner's Toolkit, which is Unix-based command line forensics data recovery utilities, and as we'll see, it's very, very powerful. Uh, there's also a front end to it called Autopsy that we will discuss later on in class, and that runs in a browser. But for right now, we're going to do everything from the command line so you really understand what are the tools that are being used. So uh, what Brian Carrier, uh, of, um, formerly of Purdue, uh, was the one who, who took the uh, the source code from the Corners Toolkit and then um, has updated it tremendously and now calls it the, the Sleuth Kit. It's essentially it's a collection of Unix-based command line tools that can analyze uh, quite a few different file systems, including NTFS, FAT, the FAST file system, and the Linux file systems, EXT2 and EXT3. It's interesting because uh, SleuthKit takes a very abstract view of the file system and can partition it into to varying abstraction layers. And uh, what we'll see is um, is that each of these is, can be used to uh, forensically, analy forensically analyze a part of the file system to give you the information that you need. But before we um, Let's skip that last section because that dealt with um, ext2 and ext3, which we haven't covered yet. So we're just going to concentrate right now on SleuthKit, and then later on we'll revisit the Linux file systems and then see how we can apply that to um, SleuthKit. So with respect to NTFS, SleuthKit allows one to view all aspects of the NTFS file structure. So the biggest difference between using SleuthKit with NTFS instead of Unix file systems is with attributes. And recall that um, that we can look at an NTFS file system as a series of object attribute values. The object is the name of the file, is the file itself. The attributes are the various uh, things that are associated with it, and the values are are the um, or whatever the values are for those attributes. It's kind of circular definition, but it works. So with Unix, you only need to reference the iDone number because there's only one piece of content for the file. And later on, you'll understand what an inode is. And an inode is essentially how a file, uh, how the operating system and file system will reference a file. They don't do that by name. They do it by the inode number because the inode number will always be unique. So with NTFS, you can either specify just the master file table number and the default data attribute uh, will be used. If more than one attribute of the same type exists, then the ID can be used after the type. So what we'll see is, is, um, is we'll, we'll see later that the 36 and 128 is an MFT entry. But if there's more than one attribute with the same name exists, then we we'll use this this unique number after that to indicate what the number of the attribute is that we're trying to uh, access. So the Sleuth Kit allows an investigator to to examine an NTFS image in many different ways. Um, for example, it allows you to create an ASCII timeline of file activity, which is something you'll do later on. Uh, what essentially that does is it breaks down every file on the file system and gives you a modified access and create time or change time depending upon the type of file system you're using. It also allows you to do a cluster analysis and mapping between clusters and the master file table entries. Uh, master file table analysis and mapping between the MFT entries and the file names, and then a file and directory level analysis, including the deleted files. And that's something that we'll be looking at today, is, is the former is actually looking at how to recover deleted files. So as I indicated before, uh, there's a conceptual model that's create, that uh, SleuthKit uses in terms of the uh, layers that are available, the abstraction layers that are available for the file system. And so, um, and each one of these layers then has various command line utilities associated with it. So the content layer uh, holds the information, the actual contents of the file. 
The metadata layer is the inode information, and that contains all the metadata about a file or directory. And um, then there's a human interface layer, it's which is what uh, users interact with with the file system. So now we're talking about the um, the actual whoops whoops the actual content. Um, excuse me, the actual logical view of a uh, file system. So we're talking about the uh, content and the metadata later. We're going to be accessing um, information by a file's inode number and the human interface layer. Then we're talking about uh, looking at a file's name rather than the inode number. <coughs> so here's some of the command line utilities. Um, so at the um, content layer, we're looking at dcat, dls, dcalc, and dstat. We won't be using these yet, but you can take a look and see what these do. Um, we will be using these for the metadata layer. So we'll be using ILS, ISTAT, and ICAT in our first uh, example here. And ILS displays inode values. ISTAT displays information about an inode, so that's going to be the metadata information. And then ICAT will display the contents of disk blocks that are allocated to that inode. And then IFIND won't be using, but that's used to determine which inode has allocated a block in an image. And we'll be using the uh, human interface layer tools, FLS, FFind, and FSstat. FLS displays file and directory entries in a directory inode, and it's a, also a good way to see uh, what files have been deleted, and then you can recover them with ICAT. FFind is determine which files have allocated, has alloc allocated an inode in an image. It's easy for me to say. And FSstat displays file system details in ASCII, and we will be using that one a little later on. Okay, ILS opens the name device and lists inode information. And uh, by default, ILS lists only the inodes of removed files, and you can operate on a disk device. So by disk device, uh, you know, let's say if we're dealing with, um, with an IDE hard drive, we can, use, we can access a disk device that way if we're looking, uh, working under Linux. Or a file containing a disk image, so we're talking about a DD image, for example, and it's most often used to collect inodes for deleted files. And then uh, we're not going to go over this now because I'm actually going to run through some examples of uh, how to use this. But this shows you um, ILS, we use the uh, dash E parameter to list every inode in the file system. Dash F you're going to have to use because that specifies the file type expects that. And then dash M can be used later on to display inode details in a format that MacTime understands. And MacTime is a program that, that takes information, metadata information uh, that's really in, not in human readable format and actually displays it so that you can look at a, a timeline analysis of files. Um, <clears throat> here's the default list only inodes of remove files, so you can actually um, include that if you like. And then some other uh, list only unallocated nodes, uh, list belonging to files that no longer exists. Um, so, and just some of the other things. Um, list only inodes with zero status change time. So if you're looking for things that uh, haven't been used in a while, maybe you could look at these things. Uh, use these um, parameters here. Let's jump right over here and start doing this, okay? Got a few files here under my Fedora Core 4. Here we've got all our uh, one, two, three. We've got three um, image files. And so let's run the file against each of those and see what we've got. It's, uh, let me see. FAT32, notice the FAT32 bit, number of sectors per FAT, the serial number, and the fact that it's unlabeled. And let's go look at the net. Whoops. Uh, DOS floppy is image3.dd and uh, file suspect. DD is a uh, FAT16 Windows 98 bootloader, so that's got Windows 98 on it. Okay, so now what we're going to do is let's look at, um, let me see, suspect.dd. Let's take a look at that. So let's run fsstat, which gives us information. Notice that none of those had NTFS uh, file system on it. That's going to be something that you're going to do for your assignment. So we're just going to look at the suspect.dd right now. It tells us it's a FAT16 system, the OEM name, the volume ID, the volume label, 
Notice it doesn't have any. The file system type label is FAT16. The sectors before the file system is 63. And then it tells you um, the reserved area in the boot sector, where the first FAT starts, where the second FAT starts, and then where the data area starts. You notice down here the metadata information about this. This is metadata information about this file system, not about a file. It's got two root directories. And it shows us the cluster size is 4096, the sector size is 512, as we would expect. And the total cluster range runs just from 2 to 51346. Why does that start at 2? Is this talking about a physical or a logical cluster number? That's going to be a logical cluster number because here it's going to start after the reserved area. And so this this is in the so uh, this is going to be the first data area two right here. It runs up to fifty one thirty four six clusters. Okay, now what we want to do is, and we can output that to a file if we need to. Let's run ILS dot uh, RF and this is a FAT file system and suspect DD. Um, I tell you what, let's run that on that. Let's go back and do something simpler first. Uh, image.3.dd. Let's see what that was. That was a FAT16 system. Excuse me, a FAT12 system. Okay. Um, if you recall from our first class, if this looks correct, the total range of sectors is 0 to 2879. Um, the FAT starts at, the master boot record starts at 0. And FAT0, which would be the first FAT, starts at 1 and goes through 9. Remember, 9 sectors comprises the first FAT. And 10 through 18, that's 9 sectors comprising the second FAT. The data area starts at 19. The root directory um, starts at 19 and ends at 32. And then the cluster area, which is actually the data area. I'm not sure why that's listing that as data area. But the cluster area, that's the actual area where the data starts, starts at 33, which will be physical or logical cluster. That will be physical cluster number. And of course, because this is a FAT12, that's equal to a sector. Each cluster is equal to a sector. And so what logical cluster number is that going to be? That's going to be 2. We look down here. That says 2 as well. OK. And then down here, this just tells you the FAT contents. It tells you what clusters are being used. So looks like right here. 33 is the first logical cluster number, and so there's a file that's composed of four clusters here in the, at the very far start of the uh, data area. Okay, so let's go and run ILS on that RF fat, and then we want to this is called image3.dd less. Again, that gives us all the information over here of all the files. And notice this says uh, that UID, the GID, um, this is the inode number, A time, C time, M time, the modes, the number of links, the size, the blocks, and so on. And so uh, notice this, this really isn't in human readable format because these are offsets from the epic, right? These times, if you recall. And so um, this is actually going to be of use when you run this through an interpreter like MacTime that actually understands these. So now what we can do is um, we've run ILS. Now recall that FLS looks at the file system um, from the human layer interface point of view. And so, whoops, FLS dash DRF. If you look back and see what those mean, the D is actually going to show us the d deleted files and directories. And so that's FAT and image. Image 3.dd. Now it shows us the names of the files, which we see here. And so recall that these are um, here's the directories, and here's just actual files. This uh, asterisk indicates these are deleted files. And so these are the ILS numbers 5, 9, 13, 17, 19, 21, 25, and so on. And so if we want to recover one of these, um, Files. We're going to use not the name, but we're going to use the inode number to actually recover one of the files. 
jump back here for a second and look at the file types that are understood by SleuthKit. If um, the fast file system for BSD, and this is the uh, the dash F parameter. This is the uh, what you would use to indicate what type of file system it is. So notice that it covers the fast file systems. It covers different types of FATs. It also covers the uh, Linux file systems, NTFS, OpenBSD, and Solaris as well. And so if we want to find uh, the inodes of deleted files, we can run ILS-RF. We give it the FAT um, here to indicate that this is a FAT file system and then the name of the uh, image. And as we saw before, what this what it gives us is the inode numbers of the removed files. That's what the dash R gives us. It's also the default, so you could actually leave that out and it would indicate as such. Now iStat display displays inode details. So it um, displays the user ID, the group ID, the mode, the size, the link numbers, modified access and created times, and so on. And so we can go back here and do this for a particular file. Let's say uh, if we saw this before, let's do this for hello world.txt right up here at the top. And then we'll do new folder. So let's do that first. So we have uh, istat-f file type image 3D and 5. It's not allocated which means it's what? It's deleted. File attributes, it's the file and it's archived, the size is 0. There's the name, which would be the what? Short name? Right. Uh, directory entry times written, accessed, and created. Number of sectors. It doesn't comprise any sectors, so there wasn't. it's either been overwritten or it never had any data in them. The file recovery is not possible. And so if we want to see if that's the case, we can use iCAT. Here we go. And the file type, and then the uh, image name, image, come on, 3TD, and then the um, the IDO number, and there's nothing there. Okay, now let's look at new folder, and we're going to say ILS dash F fat and um, image and then 30, and that's new folder. Let's see what that tells us about it. Oop, that's not what I wanted. I wanted iStat. See, so that's what you get when you only use this twice a year. There we go. Sectors, it only had a, one particular sector, 110, since it was a directory. The size, the short name, the fact that it's file attribute that it was a directory, it's not allocated, which means it's deleted. Uh, time and date stamps, and unfortunately, the file recovery is not possible. Back and run FLS, that's what I meant to run. And let's see if we can uh, recover one of these files. Let's look to an iStat against that uh, last file, inode 37029, fat image 3.td 37029. Okay, it's not allocated. Uh, size is 4096, which means it's uh, swap. Here's the written access. Created times, number of sectors, and the recovery will require uh, recovering this many um, sectors. And so let's go in and use iCAT just to show you how this works. iCAT F fat. And so we're going to uh, image3.dd and 37029 to recover the file. Covered. There we go. Let's run file against that. It's data. So let's take a look at what data means. And so if we look up here, we notice that the file's name is a.swap. We see this is a Vim swap file. And we know that because it says Vim 6.3, the user was root. And this is the name of the machine local hosted local domain and where the file was located when I was working on it. But as you'll see that was it. There really were no contents of that file. Okay. 
so um, that's what I flipped on over here to um, some of the notes that actually show you running some of these commands against an NTFS file system. So fsstat-f ntfs terror.dd tells us that the uh, file system is NTFS. The version of Windows running and this is 2000, the volume serial number, metadata information, sector size, the cluster size, so there's going to be four sectors per cluster, the cluster range, and then you have information. The master file table entry four it tells you information uh, about locations of um, the information that we talked about with respect to master file table entries. These are, what are these? This is actually indicating the definition. So if, if uh, the number of the master file table entry begins with a 16, it's standard attribute, standard information. 32 is attribute information. Most likely what you're going to see when you're going to recover a file is this number right down here, which is the data information. So anything that starts with 128 is data. Let's flip on down. What we've done here is run ILS against this to try to determine what files have been deleted. Let's see, here they are over here. These are going to be the unique numbers associated with the uh, with the deleted files. And then what we've done is we've selected one over here with uh, number 9417. That's the 9417 master file table entry. It's not allocated. The virtual ID is zero. The DOS mode is file. The size, the number of links, the name of the file, old9.temp. Here's the standard information in the file name times. And notice that this has a created, a file modified, MFT modified, and access. So recall from our last discussion that there's an MFT modified, which is sometimes called written in uh, some of the standard suites. And so that's when the last time the MFT was modified. And then it gives information about the uh, um, the attributes. So the Stanford information is it tells us information about that. If we go down to the data, this tells us that this is the um, the number. If we want to access the contents of this information, we could use this information in ICAT to actually get that information. The name is data. That's the unnamed data stream. It's non-resident, meaning what? That the information is too large to be located within the master file table, so it's going to be sitting outside of the um, master file table in the data area. This gives the size, and um, and then these are the you recall what these are. This is a cluster run, a cluster run indicating the um, the clusters that are associated with this file. And then if we go back and we want to see the name of the file associated with this iNode number, we type ff find 9417 and we see that it's the deleted file and it's old9.temp and we knew that um, because over here we used istat to give us information about this file and we saw this right here. And here, if um, this didn't actually didn't have anything, it's a temporary file that didn't have anything. But if you wanted to run strings against this, you could actually um, extract the human readable strings and look at it that way. And oh, wait, well, I guess it did. Oh, no, I see what I ran here is I ran this command first and it had uh, some non printable characters, so I just ran strings on this, and this was the result right here. So it was truly a temporary file. Okay, here's the uh, the man pages for these tools. We didn't go over foremost, although we will later on. This is a uh, foremost is a tool that uses header information to go in and extract deleted files. And so that ends this short uh, demonstration of uh, Sleuth Kit. You should go ahead and uh, either uh, check out your Nopix to make sure that's installed on your Nopix uh, CD, or you can download uh, Sleuth Kit and compile it and um, on your Linux box and start playing around with that.